Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Y'all notice how quiet it is in here today? Abby's gone. <laughs> amen. Somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Don't you tell her nothing. <laughs> she don't need to know. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start reading with verse 1. And the Bible says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. God, sometimes, sometimes the magnitude of what you say escapes us. God, I'm afraid that, Lord, that's true of the scripture that we, we read this morning. God, what happened there, what happened there has affected every life in this building. God is affecting us, and God will affect us until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. Father, we ask today that, God, you open our eyes. God, you help us to see. Help us, Lord, to understand. God, what only thy spirit, God, can illuminate. And I pray, Father, I pray, God, that there be one here that's lost. God, today, today, they'll receive Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Pray, God, that we as Christians will take heed because, God, we're looking at lies, lies that have torn this world apart. Lies, Father, that, God, we hear today. God, I pray that we'll leave this house realizing, Lord, that Thou art true. And, God, that we should rest upon Thy truth. Not what the world, the flesh, and the devil says, but the truth of God. Lord, You have Your way. Glorify Thy Son. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hate a lie. I hate a lie. Do you realize that lies are the most destructive thing that this world has ever known? Lies, beloved. Lies are, are, have, have caused more people to die and spend eternity in hell than any other thing. Lies. I want you to look good at these six verses in the third chapter of Genesis. Look, beloved, with a discerning, a discerning heart. Look with a, a meditative mind at these verses. Look, beloved, with a grieving, broken spirit. Because what you're looking at is the beginning. The beginning of all the hurt, of all the pain, all the tears, all the sorrows, all the death, the death that this world has ever or will ever experience. It begins right here. Think about it. All the times that you stood beside 
a grave of a loved one and wept and cried and your heart has broken. It started right here. Right here. All the times that you felt pain and, and sorrow for whatever reason. All the, the, the sadness that you, are, you have or ever will experience began right here. In these six small verses. Because you see here, beloved, sin was introduced to the world, infecting it with its poison. Infecting every soul born of man, beloved, on down through the ages, even until, until you and me, you and me. This, beloved, is not, this, there's not a sob or a tear, not a sigh or a groan, not a war or a famine, not a, a pestilence or a grave, not an injustice or an assault that cannot, beloved, uh, be its roots be traced to this moment in the history of man, this moment. Oh, how the angels of heaven must have shuddered when they saw it happen. How, beloved, the throne of God must have been draped in sackcloth and ashes when it took place. Somebody says, preacher, why? Why did it happen? Folks, it happened because of three, listen to me, three Obvious lies of Satan. Three lies that Eve believed. She believed. And here's the sad part. Here's the sad part. We haven't learned a thing from that. We haven't learned a thing. Because even today, beloved, almost 6,000 years later, we are still believing the same lies of the devil. The same lies. I'm talking about lost people. And I'm talking about saved people. We're still believing the same lies. Somebody says, preacher, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. What, what lies? What, what, what are we believing? Well, let's look and see. Let's look and see. First, the first obvious lie was that God is not good. That God is not good. Listen to what Satan said in verse 1. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Do you see, folks? Do you see what, he, what the devil was doing? He was trying to say, hey, God is not good to you because he's not letting you eat of every tree. Of the garden. He's not good to you. Here, here you are Eve in a beautiful garden full of fruit. Yet God says you can't eat of every tree of that garden. God's preventing you from eating of one tree. God is so bad to you. So bad to you Eve. So bad. Not to let you eat of that one tree. Folks, he was, he was insinuating that God was not good, that God was being cruel to them, that God, beloved, was being harsh with them. He was painting a picture of God, beloved, of some severe, a harsh, cruel, stern God, that God was not good. Now, was that true? Of course not. Of course not. It was, it was an obvious lie. I mean, look at what God, beloved, had done for them. God had made man in his own image. Amen? Amen. In his own image. He had created a perfect world for them to enjoy. Beloved, he had, he had planted the most beautiful garden in the world for them to dwell in. And in that garden, beloved, was all that they could ever desire, all that they could eat, all that they could ever want. 
and there was no sickness, and there was no, no sorrow, and there was no hurt, and there was no, no, no pain. It was called paradise. Paradise. God, beloved, was, had, had it even blessed them with his presence. Beloved, they could, they could know and fellowship with their God. They had a perfect climate. Can you imagine not having to turn a thermostat or an air conditioner on? It was perfect. It was perfect. They had the sun, beloved, by day and, and the moon and the stars by night, the stars of heaven to enjoy. It was all theirs. It was all theirs. And everywhere they looked, beloved, all they saw was the goodness of God to them. The trees and the brooks proclaimed the goodness of God. Beloved, the mountains and the valleys proclaimed the goodness of God. The flowers and the rolling meadows, beloved, proclaimed, oh, God is so good. Everything said, God. Is good. But along comes one. One who says, Oh, God won't let you eat of every tree of the garden. Oh, how bad God is to you. Was that true? Folks, there was one tree in all that garden that God forbid them to eat. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, yes, God forbid that one tree. You know why? Because God knew the day they ate of that tree, they would surely die. They would surely die. Now, was that good or bad on God's part? Talk to me. That was good. That was good. Was it good or bad that he forbid that tree? Because he knew that they, that tree would kill them. It was good. It was good. I got news for you. Everything God does is good. It's good. Amen. Everything. Everything. Folks, any time God, now listen to this. Anytime God forbids us to do something, it's for our good. It's for our good. And it shows God's goodness. But, oh, we haven't learned that yet, have we? We haven't learned that. You see, people still, beloved, have the idea, well, God is bad. That They've swallowed the lie of the devil. They still believe, you know, if God forbids this or that, it's because he's bad to me. He wants to ruin my fun. He wants to, he don't want me to enjoy myself. He, he wants to destroy my happiness. I remember years ago witnessing to a, a, a man. He, he was young then and so was I. He's old now and so am I. And I remember witnessing to him. Telling him about the Lord. And I was so excited because he was a friend of mine. And I got to the part where he needed to receive Christ as his Lord and Savior. God was going to wash away his sins. God was going to write his name in the book of life. God was going to get him to heaven for an eternal home. He was going to have everlasting life. I got to that point. And I said, don't you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior? And he looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, I would, but I want to enjoy myself. I'm young, and I want to enjoy. You know what he was saying? God don't want me to enjoy myself. And he would not accept Christ. He wouldn't do it. And he enjoyed himself. He enjoyed himself with the liquor and the drugs. And he ended up, beloved, in hurting his family. And he ended up going to prison. And he ended up, beloved, ruining his, his, so many that, that, that knew him, that were influenced by him. So many. 
oh, but God, God wants to destroy my fun. My fun. They never look at all the blessings that God had blessed them with. Just in what God forbids. And what God forbids, God had blessed him. Listen, God had blessed Adam and Eve with life, with health. And beloved, God has blessed you and me with life and health and parents and family. God has given us a mind to think and strength to work. God has given us a creation to enjoy. God has blessed us, beloved, with eyes to see and ears to hear and feet to walk and people to love and folks to love us back. And everywhere we look, beloved, we see the goodness of God toward us. Toward us. But God is so bad to me because he won't let me do exactly what I want to do. What I want to do. I want to drink. But God says no. Woe unto him. That, that, uh, woe unto, uh, how is that? Woe, I, I, I lost my place. Hold on. Uh, woe unto, look, thou, look not thou upon the cup when it moveth. You know what that means? When it's fermented. When it moveth. God don't want me to drink. Hey, I want to have an affair, but my God, but God says, no, thou shalt not commit adultery. I want to have a good time, preacher. I want to party hearty. I want the drugs. I want, I want all that life has. I want to enjoy this life like everybody else does. God says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that travel there. Many there be. Oh, God is so bad to me. How about you, Christian? You think God's bad to you? Listen, He saved your never dying soul. Amen? Whoa, listen. He gave you everlasting life. He's preparing, beloved, a home in glory for you. He's adopted you into the family of God. He gave his own son to die in your place. Yet God forbid, God forbid you, listen, to forsake the assembling. Oh, preacher, don't go there. To forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And you want to rest. You want the comfort. You, you, God just don't want me to enjoy that TV program that comes on Sunday night. He just, he don't, he don't want me to rest. He don't want me to rest. He forbids you. He forbids you, Christian, to love the world. To love the world and yield to the flesh. Oh, but you want to love the world. And you want to, to, to cater to the flesh. He forbids you, beloved, from, from bowing to other gods before him. But oh, how you want to put so much in front of God, before God. Oh, God just being bad to me. No, he's being good. He's being good. Because, you see, he knows more than you and I know. Amen? Amen. And he knows, beloved, that that, that, that that drink and drugs will ruin your life. He has seen it. He over and over. He has seen the broken bodies on the highway. Where you might see it once or twice or maybe three times, he sees it all the time. All the time. He's seen the ruined lives that the drugs cause. He's seen, beloved, the smashed bodies, the addiction destroying lives and destroying families. He knows how adultery and fornication will tear apart, beloved. He has seen it. He has seen it. 
He knows, Christian, how the world and the flesh will destroy your faith, will tear apart your life, will break your fellowship with God. He knows. He knows how missing church will weaken you and rob you and, and will open the door for Satan to come into your life. He knows. You can, go, you can go on down the line. Everything that God forbids is, beloved, is not God being bad to you. It is God being so good to you. So good to you. Oh, listen, there are people out there who want nothing to do with God. Because, you see, beloved, they have the impression that God is bad. Now we're living in the last minutes of the last days and you are seeing more and more and more people who don't want to hear God's name. Don't want to hear. There are Christians, beloved, who will not obey God in the simplest things because in their heart they believe God is being bad to them. And what they've done is this. They have believed the first lie that was ever told, the lie of Satan. The second question, thought, excuse me, the second obvious lie that the serpent told was this. God has not told you the truth. God hasn't told you the truth. When Eve, beloved, heard the first lie of Satan, she said, we, we may eat of every tree of the garden except the tree in the midst of the garden, in the middle of the garden. God said that if we eat of that tree, we should not eat of that tree, least we die. Listen to what the devil said in verse 4. Ye shall not surely die. In other words, God's lying to you. That's what he was saying. God is lying to you. He's not telling you the truth. God is not, not trustworthy in what he says to you. Now, folks, again, this was an obvious lie. I want you to follow me close. If Eve had stopped and thought for just a moment, she'd have known this was the biggest lie, the biggest lie. Eve, when did God ever lie to you? When did he ever lie to you? I, th this slimy serpent comes and, and, and ta tells you that God lied. When did it happen? Now, we don't know how long they were in the garden, beloved. It may have been a short time or it may have been a long time. But I can guarantee you this, beloved. God never, ever, ever told them a lie. Never told them a lie. We know that he came, beloved, in the cool of the day and walked and talked with them. So there was opportunity for God to lie, beloved, but he never did. He never did. Somebody says, how do you know, preacher? Because he was God. And listen to me. And he's still God. He's still God. You see, that is proof positive that God never lied. Now, let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. Folks, if God had lied to them, he would no longer be God. He would no longer be God. You see, God is righteous, amen? God is holy, amen? God is, is just, amen? God is truth, amen? He is truth, beloved. God is all of those things. But, beloved, if God lied, he wouldn't be any of those things. He would no longer be God. He'd no longer be God. And it's God, now get this, it's God that holds this earth 
and this world and everything in it together. Together. Y'all see this desk? This desk is solid, amen? But do you know, beloved, that it is full of space? What do you mean, preacher? I mean it's made up of atoms. And, beloved, there's space in between those atoms. You see that? Well, what keeps these things from just flying away, these atoms? God. God. You say, preacher, where do you get that from? Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Listen to what the Bible says about Jesus, okay? And by the way, Jesus is God in a body of flesh. Amen? Amen. All right. Listen to what it says. He, that is Jesus, is before all things and by him all things consist. What does that mean? It means he keeps everything together. Amen? Amen. He's God. He keeps it all together, beloved. Beloved, here was the, the father of lies saying, telling Eve. In, in the midst of God's creation, God lied to you. What an obvious lie. Beloved, if God were to lie, he'd no longer be God, and then all creation would fly apart because there'd be no one to hold it together anymore. Eve, you see those trees over there? Do you see that sun in the sky? Do you see the beauty of it all? Do you see the animals that God's created? Then God didn't lie to you when he said eat of that tree and you'll die because all of creation is still hanging together. Still hanging together. God is still God. And what, what beloved and obvious lie this was. But how many lost and saved are still believing that lie about God? Y'all see this book right here? I'm going to tell you, you don't, we don't realize it, but we are looking at an amazing thing in that book. You know why? Because that book is the Word of God. Every jot and every tittle is the Word of God. It's called the Holy Scriptures. That's because, beloved, it's the written Word of God. Every bit of this was inspired by God. By God. 2 Timothy 2.15 All Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Think about that for a minute. What's in heaven? Hey, that which is in heaven is eternal. Amen? God's word is eternal. Amen? Amen? Hey, that which is in heaven is righteous. Amen? God's word is righteous. That which is in heaven, beloved, is holy. Amen? God's word is holy, is forever settled in heaven. Jesus said about God's word, he says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. One tittle. You know what that is? That's one of the smallest punctuation marks in the Word of God. Jesus said this Word can, can go, heaven can go, but brother, that Word of God is going to come to pass. It's not going to fail. It's God's Word, and God cannot lie. So tell me, lost person, Tell me, why don't you believe what God says? Why? 
Oh, I do, preacher. I, I believe the Bible. I believe the, I've had so many lost people tell me that. And I don't mean to put anybody down. I am so sorry, but listen to me. If you're lost, you don't believe the Bible. You don't believe it, friend. But my mama and my grandma, talk about your mom and grandmama, God bless them. Talk about you. You don't believe the Bible. God says you're condemned already, but you make no move. God says, beloved, the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. God says that you will spend eternity in a lake of fire, in torment, in torment for your sin unless you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God says if you receive His Death as the payment for your sin, beloved. He'll wash your sins away. He'll save your never dying soul. He'll give you heaven and you'll become a child of God. Now if you truly, truly believe God, friend, you'd be running to this altar. You'd be falling on your face before God, crying out for God's mercy and God's grace. You'd receive him as Lord and Savior and let him into your life. But the fact that you don't, the fact that you don't shows you believe the lie of Satan. That God is lying when God says you are a sinner. That God is lying when God says that you will spend eternity in hell. Oh, how foolish can you be? How foolish can you be? What about you, Christian? Why don't you believe God? God tells us all have sinned. God tells us all will perish without Christ. Listen to me. That means your loved ones, your, your friends, your relatives that haven't received Christ are going to die and spend eternity in hell. You believe that? Then why aren't we at the altar praying for their souls? Why don't we come and pray for revival to sweep this area? Because we really don't believe it. Not in here. Why aren't we witnessing to them? Why aren't we going to them with tears running down her face, looking at that condemned face and saying, I love you and I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to die. I want you to be with me in heaven forever and ever. I'll guarantee you, if that bridge was washed out down there and your loved one was coming down that road, you would be out there flagging them, waving at them, throwing yourself in front of their car, anything you could do to tell them, please, don't go down there because it's washed out. And you will die. But we go on our merry way. While our loved ones pass away into eternity, lost. Our friends, our neighbors, lost, lost. God, give us a burden for the lost. Gypsy Smith, they went to see him one day, great preacher. He was sitting there praying, praying. They came in and they said, Preacher Smith, why do you pray so much? Why do you preach so hard? Why do you do it? And he was in a corner room. 
And he went to the window and he picked up. He opened the window and he said, because they're lost. And he went to the other window and picked that window up and said, because they're lost. And he went back and forth and back and forth from window to window. Crying. They're lost. They're lost. They're lost. He believed the word of God. He believed what God said. Everything, everything reasonable says we should be like that. If we believe it, if we believe it, God says, Christian, that he's going to rapture his church any moment. When he does, all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will give an account of, of what we've done, beloved, uh, since we've been saved. Are we obedient to him? Sometimes. Are, are, are we faithful to him? Well, sometimes. Are we loving and serving as Jesus did? Well, sometimes. Are we living, beloved? Are we living holy lives? Well, sometimes. What about the times that we're not? What about the times? Why aren't we on our knees at the altar knowing that we're going to stand before Jesus and it could happen any moment and give an account to him for what we've done as Christians? Why, beloved, aren't we on our knees confessing our sins and getting right with God? Y'all say, preacher, you crazy. I'm old. Y'all saw me when I was young. I'm going to break some up here one day. Why aren't we on our knees asking God to forgive us? Could it be that we don't really believe what God said? What God said. Could it be that we believe God is lying about the judgment seat of Christ? By the way, Paul says concerning the judgment seat of Christ, he said, knowing the terror of the Lord we persuade men. We persuade men. Oh, how we've fallen for the lie of the devil that God is lying about what he's told us. Third, the third obvious lie that brought about the fall of man was this. God is holding you back. God is holding you back. Look at verse 5. Look at what it says. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Folks, Satan says, God knows. The reason God won't let you eat of that tree, God knows you eat of that tree and you're going to be as gods. He's trying to hold you down. He's trying to keep something good from you. Again, this is an obvious lie. Folks, God doesn't want to hold us back from anything good. Amen? Amen. Beloved, he wants to elevate us to something better than what we are. Better than what we are. Oh, he, before you eat that forbidden fruit, you think, has God not elevated you every time? Every time. Look at Adam. Look at him. He was the dust of the ground. But God elevated him, amen, made him a man, a living soul. Look at you, Eve. You were a rib. You were a hunk of flesh. And God elevated you and made you the most wonderful creature, a woman, the mother of all living. And then 
there you two were. You couldn't climb a tree like the monkey. You couldn't, you didn't have the strength of the bear. You did you couldn't run like the deer. You couldn't swim like the fish. But God crowned you king and queen of all creation. He gave you dominion upon over all the earth. Whoa. From the smallest insect to the largest whale. I'd call that. Elevating, amen? amen? Elevating. In fact, everything God did seemed to elevate you, Eve. He, look, he, he even walked and talked with you in the garden. He didn't do that with the owl. He didn't do that with the lion. But here you are believing a lie that is so obvious that God is holding you back from something good. Well, Eve believed it. And she took of that which was forbidden. And she gave to her husband. And that stupid rascal ate it. He ate. Y'all know why he ate it? The Bible says he wasn't deceived. He was so dumb. Eve had eaten it and was, was, had sinned. And the only way he could be with her was to eat it too. He loved her so much. And she can do what she wants to, but I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. But he loved her so much. <laughs> but here you are believing a lie. Instead of believing God, you're believing a lie. And instead of becoming God's, they became a fallen race, a fallen race. They lost everything, everything, everything that God had given to them. Paradise was gone. Fellowship with God was gone. They were wretched and poor and sinners, beloved, doomed to hell. And so were their children and their children and their children and their children, and their children down to today. So here we are in a world of pain and sorrow and death and destruction with the eternal torments of hell waiting for us. Oh, but God, God wants to elevate us. Beloved, he wants to give us life, not death, heaven, not hell, joy, not sadness and sorrow, peace, not worry and trials and tribulations. He wants to give us righteousness for our, our sin. Amen. Folks, that's why Jesus came. See, he took our death to elevate us to life. He took our sin and offers us his righteousness. He took our hell and offers us heaven. He took our, our separation from God and offers us sweet fellowship forever. And all we must do is believe on him, receive him as Lord and Savior. So what will it be? Will you believe the lies of Satan? Or will you believe that God wants to elevate you, to elevate your life? Three. Three obvious lies, folks. Yet so many are believing those same lies today. But not you. Not you. I pray, not you. I pray. Because deep in your heart, you know 
that God is good. Amen? Amen. You know, beloved, that God is true. Amen? Amen? You know, beloved, that God wants to elevate every part of you. If you believe God, if you believe Him, then come to Him. Come to Him. I want you to stand, heads bowed and eyes closed.